In Britain, there are 71 million pets. Most of us stick with just a dog or a cat. But have some people got too many? <laughs> oh, hello. <laughs> Come for a cuddle. I've made films about my mum and others who fill their houses with so many possessions, it's taken over their lives. I tried to help them confront reality and move on. But I'm an animal lover, and in this film, I'm going to meet people who have gone to extremes and have let the animals take over. It would be so easy for me to end up with lots and lots of animals. You know, it's in me, that love for them and that desire to care for them. And I can see how it would be very, very easy Where is it? to let that happen. I'm travelling around Britain to meet people who've crossed a line and have sacrificed their own lives for their animals. I'm going to find out how they cope and if it's good for them or their animals and if something needs to be done. First of all, I'm on my way to North Devon. I'm going to meet Lynn Lines. Lynn's got 17 dogs. Nearly all are German Shepherds. I've always loved the nature of a German Shepherd. I'm coming. Mama's coming. They come across as being proud and upstanding and loyal and everything that I see as being something good in people as well as dogs. But her love for the dogs has become her life. Hello, Wars. My life is Hello. about rescuing dogs in need. If we've got a space and a dog needs help, I will step in and help if I possibly can. Lynn runs a charity with a network of volunteers who raise thousands of pounds every year for the dogs. Many of the rescues stay with her for weeks or months, so there are always around 17 dogs living in the house with her and her husband, Bob. Hello, Dodo. She's set in her ways and she's so passionate. She wants to try and rescue every dog. You've got to keep telling her you can only rescue so many. There is the right number of dogs for a house this size, and I've got too many. No, it's mine. Excuse me, I've got my coffee bin drank. And the dogs we take in, nine times out of ten, are going to die if we, if we don't take them in. The house isn't big enough. The garden isn't big enough. But we manage. Tenders get stressed sometimes. If there's noisy dogs here, or if I come and find all the dogs chewed up another settee or whatever, I, I do tend to sort of blow me top a bit. But I'm obsessed. I, I, I can't leave a dog in trouble if I can help it. One person looking after so many German shepherds sounds completely exhausting and I've not even seen how Lynn manages. Quite a surprise because it just looks like an ordinary house. I know she's got about 17 or so dogs at the moment. And I'm just thinking, how do they all fit? They must be crammed together in this house and that's surely tough going. So I want to know how and if Lynn Bob and the dogs manage to get along. How many are there? I could name them all, but I actually couldn't. I, I never count them. Bob quite often says to me, how many is here? And I say, I don't know. And I would occasionally walk think. I haven't seen that one before. <laughs> <laughs> Everywhere I look, I can see dogs. 
four of Lynn's dogs and two rescues in the living room, their two Labradors on the stairs, and eight other rescues in their den-like crates in what's meant to be the dining room. Although it may look harsh, it's common practice for rescued dogs to spend some time in crates to make them feel safe as they start their journey to recovery. So who's this one out here? This is Atan. Atan's come over from Romania. Um, he's not very keen on people at the moment. Okay. He's got a lot better, but I still wouldn't wouldn't risk anybody when he goes out with he's me. All right he's all with you? Yeah. There's a really nice dog in there waiting to come out. Yeah. So if you just stay back a bit, cos he will jump right, up yeah. to say hello. Hello, handsome man. I meet Atan, one of ten dogs the charity has rescued this year from Romania, where dog abuse is rife. Hey, Bringing each dog to Britain can cost hundreds. And it could be months before Lynn considers Atan is safe and ready for rehoming. Look how excited he is about his food. <laughs> I watch as Lynn feeds Atan. Oh, is it good, lad? And then cleans up the back garden, which has to be done throughout the day. She then lets out the rescue dogs in the right order to prevent tensions. Good boy. <laughs> He's not interested in me. He's only interested in breakfast. Hello, Lolly. Come in. There you go. Lynn knows which ones can go out together and which ones need to be alone. Good boy. <laughs> <laughs> when they decide to go, they go. And I watch Lynn feed her dogs and the two rescues, which all have their own places in the kitchen where they like to eat. I, I, I'm like my head's slightly scrambled at the moment. You know, all the different personalities, all their different relationships, having to keep them all separated. It's certainly challenging. Whew. I'm actually just worn out watching. It's amazing work, but she's doing it in her own home. It's taken over her house. How does it feel for you being married to Lynn, who's just so devoted to the dogs. Yeah, it's it's hard work sometimes. For you? <laughs> For me, yeah. In what way? Um, sometimes it goes over the top, too many dogs here. Are you as devoted to the cause as Lynn is? I'll do everything I can to help. But obviously, I've got to go out to work and earn the money and try and keep the house and everything. And uh, So, yeah, I, I do as much as I can, but uh, Lynn is totally... 24 7, 100%. Where, where I, I suppose I can switch off from it a bit and say, right, I'm off out for the day. <laughs> yeah. So she can't switch off ever or go out no. for the day? Right, I'll see you later. <laughs> Have drive, a good day. Yeah, drive safe, love. Yeah. What's Poppy's story? She'd been found dumped in a field. Um, she'd been basically bitten all over her body. Our thoughts are that she was used as a bait dog, so probably muzzled up and tied up so that the other dogs could practise their attack mode on her. Um, what? What? And so you're saying that Poppy was, she was left used in the as field. live bait, basically? Yeah, she was left in the field to die. When I got up at the vets, they, they really didn't think that there was a chance in hell that I'd get her to survive. Um, She's taken months and months and months of care to get her this far, and she's still a long way off. A couple of times I've been told that it might be best for her to put her to sleep, but she wags her tail, she eats well, um, she loves being here. There's nothing telling me that she's depressed and, and unhappy enough, that, that she's had enough. I love you. Oh, those are good. Tara, thank you. Do you ever need yourself a little bit of a break from the dogs? I quite often need it, but I don't get it. The dogs can't just go without just because I feel like I need to to take time out. So 
Do you I... have anyone helping you? Not, ha not here at home, no. So all their day-to-day -day care, all their dogs, all the dogs' needs, basically fall squarely on your shoulders. Yeah. And that's a responsibility you take on happily. Very, very happily, yeah. But given the effort needed to save each dog, I wonder what Lynn feels about the number of dogs she takes in. I do know when to stop, and it's normally when I've got one or two too many, but I won't go, if you see what I mean, I won't go over that. that. I know when I really, really can't take anything else. I think Lynn knows that she's overstretching herself. And although I do admire her dog rescue, I'm concerned about her. Now I'm going to East London to meet somebody whose problems come from a love of cats. Since I can remember, I've always had cats. I love seeing them running around, it's, it's lovely. Only five years ago, Brian Beaupierre was a two-cat man. But since then, at least another 20 have moved in, uninvited. From what I understand, he had two to begin with, and somehow it's all escalated and he's got probably a, f a few more than he wants now. If I'm looking at it realistically, then there are a lot of freedoms I've had to give up for this amount of animals. Time and money, they're the main sacrifices I've had to do. They can get expensive. Every month, Brian's paying out nearly £200 in cat food. That's about as much as I can carry. But up until a few years ago, Brian was well paid as an architectural draftsman. He had an expensive car and flat and travelled frequently. Now, Brian's life is spent looking after cats. People have suggested taking them to the forest, taking them to one of these cat shelters and just leaving them outside the front there. All of these are just totally inappropriate as far as I'm concerned. I need to resolve it. It's not a case of can I, it's a case of how do I. I just wonder if Brian feels like there's a problem, if he's struggling with anything. Jasmine. Hello, Jasmine. I've just spotted one of your cats in there. Yeah, you'll find them yeah. all over the place. How many have you got in total? I counted them the other day. I think there's 26. 26? In total. Pretty much got an open-door policy when it comes to feeding animals, and I suppose that's why I've ended up with so many. Give me a tour, then. Well, it's only a few rooms I allow them in, if I'm honest. Hello. On the bed. Hello, that's... Puss. What's this one's name? That one's Hayley. How many of them sleep up here with you in bed? Um, I've counted 13 on the bed before I've even got on the bed. In Brian's house, there's always another cat hiding or sleeping. And I haven't even explored downstairs yet. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and this one's magic, I call her. So, how many have we got in here? There are five, six, seven. Under here, who's that? Um, what have I called him? I'm struggling for his name. I'm really struggling for his name. Um, who's this in the basket? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I've lost two printers where they decided to wee in them and oh. destroy them. I can also see that Brian's house is full of exposed brickwork and wiring. With 26 cats in the way, the decorating has become a low priority for Brian. How will you progress then with this? 
work that needs doing. If you've got any suggestions, let me know, <laughs> please. Tell me what you get out of having all these cats. They're grateful. They're grateful and um, I enjoy seeing that. They're grateful to you for caring for them? Well, it seems so. Do you feel like this is your fate, almost? At the moment, that's what I'm dealing with, and I'll enjoy it. I'll do whatever I need to do, and when things need to change, they'll change. But um, at the moment, um, the sacrifices I've made, the sacrifices I'm making um, because of the cats, I think it's something I need to do anyway. They're going to be here to um, encourage me to do what I want to do. And Do they, though? Well, I don't know, because I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing, so... What do you I can... mean? Well, life, just life in general. It's, um, who knows what we are supposed to do. It's all, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. You obviously feel a big responsibility, though, for the cats that are in your care. Well, they came to me. I haven't got any banners out there saying cats welcome. They know you're a soft touch. <laughs> well, somehow they do. <laughs> I don't know how they do, but... I think it will be a big struggle for Brian to get rid of some of his cats because, in his mind, I don't think he's 100% clear about why he's got to do it. You do sort of wonder what would have to happen for him to say, OK, that's it, I've got to do something about this. Both Brian's and Lynn's houses are overrun with animals. But I wonder if problems always come with numbers. Ravenhaven in Berkshire is home to 400 rescued wild birds living in a large house and garden. Eight people also live here, including the owner, Steve Burns. Nice to meet you, Steve. Welcome to Ravenhaven, Thank or should you. I say the madhouse? Thank you. Ah! I hear some birds. Right, this is uh, the kitchen. Hi, everyone. This is, Hi, I'm this Jasmine. Is the, this is the hub of the place. This is where it all happens. Wow. Yeah, this is Amy. Hi, Amy. Hi. 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 This is Alex over there preparing the raptors' food. Hello. Preparing whose food? The raptors, all the birds of prey. OK. And this, this is Sue. Hello. Hi, Hi Sue. Sue. Uh, this is Becky. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet uh, you. Then this is Phil. Hi. Steve now has seven bird-obsessed helpers actually living here. Their rent and charity events raise just enough cash to keep it all going. This is the recovery room. My Bird goodness. birds are in here. They've all got all kinds of problems. This is our critical care um, unit, really. Steve saved birds as a boy and he set up Raven Haven in his 30s. Now, the public bring in injured birds, which Steve and the gang nurse back to health. We've rescued well over 1,500 this year. Wow! It's going to be noisy in here. Is it? Yes. This is our parrot section. Ah. Enough, enough, enough. Thank you. Most of the parrots in Steve's back room were rescued from harsh conditions, and many of them will stay for life. Right, this is the living room. Hello, Hitch. Hello, Gilbert. Hello, boys. <laughs> 150 birds live inside, but another 250 live in Steve's garden. The aim is to release as many birds as possible back into the wild. That includes the ravens that give the place its name. There we go. Come on now. I'm surprised to see what they eat, actually. Yeah, well, of course, they're scavengers. The local fish and chip shop, every night at 10 o'clock, everything they haven't sold goes into a bag and comes down for the birds. They get pies, they get saveloys, they get fish, you name it. I get it. Critical question. Yeah. How often do you get pooed on? <laughs> <laughs> Quite regularly. <laughs> You're looking after birds, but are you also... There's an environment of looking after the people as well. Yeah, very much so. And do you think some of the people that are drawn here are in, at a time in their lives where they need that sort of helping hand as well? Without a doubt, yeah. 
Without a doubt, absolutely, definitely. I think sometimes by helping something else, you help yourself. I had about 60 parrots with me, so... Um, <laughs> it wasn't just me moving in, it was me and all the parrots. 60 parrots. And some finches and other birds. So, yeah, we all moved in. So it sounds like, actually, the fact that there are lots of you here and lots of people all getting involved and having a laugh, it's also about being part of a group. Definitely, cos I used to be on my own with all my parrots for several years. And how was that different to now? Well, it's human company, isn't it? So, whereas it was just me, I'd just come home from work and get on, feed the parrots, talk to my parrots. There was no-one else to talk to now. We can sit and have a cup of tea and a laugh and a joke and everybody helps each other out. And it's, um, it's more fun. Even if you were doing it on a small scale, on your own, mm -hmm. do you think it would be as rewarding? It wouldn't be as enjoyable because I wouldn't have a spare moment to do anything else. Even though I don't think Steve set out with this plan, Bye. Ravenhaven seems to be working for both the birds and the people. I'm still bothered about Brian. He says he's got too many cats, but also that he doesn't mind. I want to get to the root of his problem. But first, we meet his neighbour Rose, who knows Brian and feeds his cats on the occasions he does get away. Obviously, both of you are animal lovers. I am too. Yeah. And I don't think I could refuse to help a stray animal that turned up on my door. That's right. But the danger is that you end up turning into a cat rescue centre, which I think is That's almost right. pretty much what's happened to yeah. me and Brian. There's so many, and they just keep coming and coming, and they say, right, food's up down there, let's all go down there. And he doesn't like refusing cats anything. I mean, I've known him give up his own food because he hasn't had enough tins to supply all these ones that come to him. So his ideal situation, Jasmine, get rid of at least 12 to 14 cats. He can go back to how he was several years ago. Did you know Brian when he had just two cats? Yes, that's right. it. And he was much more outgoing. He used to be going out with friends and that and just into someone else's house for perhaps a game of cards or something like that. But he has no opportunity because he's looking after them the whole day and night. And that he can always relax when he goes to bed because they go to bed with him. <laughs> Follow him up the stairs. Brian, it sounds like there is nothing is... more to life than cats. <laughs> that needs to change. That does need to change. That needs to change. Till we meet again. Yes. And you keep an eye on him for me. Well. <laughs> See you later, Brian. Bye bye now. <laughs> See you soon. Bye. Bye then. Bye. Brian used to have a more upmarket lifestyle and a healthy income. And I'm struggling to imagine this more outgoing Brian who Rose describes. Who was Brian before he had any cats? Brian was a egoistic, materialistic, um, financially motivated individual. Wow. Um, that doesn't sound like you at all. I was very much... I'll say focused on the wrong aspects of life and perhaps bow into what I thought other people would want me to be, be the person who um, I truly wasn't, basically being an actor. Was there anything better about that life pre-Cats for that Brian than there is now? Is there anything that he had that you haven't got now? Not a great deal. <laughs> perhaps the finances right now. Um, but apart from that, um, more personally, um, the drive I used to have was second to none. I mean, if I was determined, if I was going to do something, then um, it would get done. I don't feel Brian will commit to dealing with his cat problem. Next time, I want to bring somebody to help sort things out with him. 
Although Brian's intentions are hard to pin down, I feel that Lynn wants to keep going at all costs. Oh, Jacob! But I want to know more about the high price she pays, both mentally Ready? and physically. Hey, He's not quite as fast as Sherman. No. <laughs> yeah, leave it. Good boy. Oh, oh, yeah. Good girl! Weather-wise, <laughs> How many, is... how many walks have you got to do in this weather on a day like today? There'll be three, three van loads today. We can't say just because it's raining that the dogs aren't going to get, aren't going to get what they need. They have to have the exercise, so we turn out. <laughs> you know, on a good day it's like, oh, Bosco, no. Huh. Ready? Yeah, see me. <laughs> So much fun to see them all running around having a great time. You can see she just lives for it, lives for these dogs. Even in this horrible weather, you know, she'll be out here several times in a day. Emotionally, mentally, I imagine it's actually very rewarding, but nonetheless, it's a massive commitment. Yeah. <laughs> Good girl. How did it start then, the, you know, with your rescue? I collapsed at work. I'm, I'd been in a lot of pain for a long time and I just ignored it and just thought, I'll, I'll keep going and um, it'll go away. Years ago, when Lynn was a chef, she was diagnosed with a serious and permanent bone and joint condition. At that time, it stopped her working altogether. How does that relate to you starting working with rescue dogs? I found myself sitting in, because I was in agony as well, sitting indoors getting more and more depressed. I stopped talking. I mean, God knows what Bob must have thought. One day I thought I'd, I just thought I'd help one of the local rescues and I phoned up and asked if they needed any foster homes or if there's anything I could do. It was a case of, I, you know, either I do something to help myself or God knows where I'll end up. It sounds like in the depths of depression, actually looking after dogs that needed rescuing gave you something to live for. It, without, a, without a doubt, I consider that the dog saved my life. I think that I would have, I think that I would have taken my own life and that's being honest. So I feel I'll never, ever repay that. I, no matter what I do in rescue, I'll never repay that. So do other people know about what you've been through? No. I, I tend to, to keep it pretty much to myself. You've, it makes you feel um, weak that you haven't been able to cope with something. Because uh, I've always considered myself to be a really strong person. And I think that's... Probably, I found a weakness in myself that I actually didn't know was there. If you do feel yourself starting to get low again, having the dogs here heals that. They inspire me to, 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 keep, to keep strong and keep going, yeah. And what happens if your health fails? I haven't even gone down that route. It's probably not a good route to go down. It's, it's probably something that is best dealt with when, when and if that ever, ever comes up. Do you feel that there are things that you miss because of having all the dogs? Oh, yeah, definitely. We miss out on the social life like we used to have. Yeah. The very few occasions we do, it's such a rigmarole, isn't it? Mm. It, it really is. It's just calling calling on people and, and uh, timing issues, mm. you know. How often do you get to go out for a meal together in the evening? Mummy. <laughs> it was the last time several years ago, wasn't it? Can't remember it at all. Several years ago. Is it important that you don't get holidays, you don't get to go out of an evening? I still would like to spend an evening out 
mm. with you. That's me being a hundred percent honest. I do mm. think that that maybe we do sacrifice just a tad too much. She and Bob really deserve to have a life together that isn't completely dominated by the dogs 100% of the time. There should be a proportion of, of their relationship that isn't centred around the dogs. With my illness, I tend not to be able to sleep in bed. I go up there and I'm instantly in pain. So um, it's easier for me to just crash out here. At least down here, I don't disturb Bob during the night. I miss my cuddles. We'd always have a bit of a cuddle before going to sleep and tell each other about the day. And of course, for the last few years, it's not been possible. It's, I, I just can't sleep upstairs. Just looking through an old photo album, photos of family, holidays, and some of our old pets. Most importantly, my dog Sparky, who I got when I was 11, and who I had until I was 27. So he lived until he was 16. I just loved him so much, and he responded to me in a way that made me think that he felt the same way. I remember being in bed that first night and hearing him crying downstairs and going down to where he was sleeping and just cuddling up with him on the floor and staying there. I just didn't look after him as well as I should have. I didn't walk him enough and just didn't really give him a good enough life. That's why I think I spoil my dog now, sort of in some way to make up for it. It doesn't, but it makes me feel better. There's so much joy and yet so much pain involved in owning pets. So I wonder how people with lots of animals manage to cope with the roller coaster of emotions. And I think Brian is more committed to his cats than he realizes. So letting go won't be easy. I think an expert could help untangle the emotions. I've called in therapist and cat behaviorist, Vicky Halls. Brian, Vicky is here to get to the get to the bottom of <laughs> the cat situation. That would be nice. That would be really nice, Vicky. To help Brian, Vicky needs to see for herself how the cats are living together in his house. So this is a popular venue for them, is it? Definitely, yes. Um, it's your bedroom. Yes. Pretty much guarantee there'll be a cat in here. 24-7. And this is where most of them congregate because right. of the food, obviously. Thirteen bowls, twenty-six um, cats. Yeah. Do they, they share to each? No, they they do it in shifts. Oh, they do it in shifts. Yeah, yeah, that's the only way I can do it. Just first come, first serve. You see there's a little bit of tension. Are there too many cats here for this house? Yes. In my opinion, absolutely. If, if we are trying to give cats what they need, then they have very basic fundamental needs to have um, access to food where they don't have to fight for it, access to bed somewhere uh, uh, warm and, and uh, safe. 
they're all provided here, but 26 cats have to use those facilities. That creates stress, that creates conflict and tension because you are competing for resources that feel scarce. Vicky is clear that Brian does have too many cats, but she needs to know what he thinks. So how many of those cats do you actually consider you own? Oh, that's, a, that's a funny question, because I don't own anything. I mean, how can I own a cat? I didn't make it. I look after cats. I look after them, but I don't own them. What do you consider your responsibility is to look after? I'll do whatever I need to do, um, take them to the vets, I'll take them to... Um, I'll feed them, I'll pet them as much as I can. But if I'm honest, I can't give all 26 cats the attention they need. That's really interesting because I imagine with 26 and a few others coming in, you know, you have to spread yourself really thinly. So what I think I'm hearing you say is the fact that what you want for some of your cats is that special one-to-one -one with someone. That would be nice. Okay. That would be absolutely ideal. Knowing now that Brian wants the best for his cats, Vicky needs him to face the reality that some need new homes. But how many could go and which ones? So, Vicky, what's the next stage of this process? I think, really, let's just cut to the chase. Let's pick out the ones now that you're OK about rehoming. OK. Um, there's Scraggles and Charlie. Scraggles and Charlie. Blue and Bad Leg. Blue and Bad Leg. Um, good Black one, Hayley. This is Hayley. Big Black. Black. Mummy Black. Mummy Black. Black Weeping Eye. Nimbus. Oliver. It's going awfully well, Oliver. White Mummy. Black Good. <laughs> Max, Excuse me. This one. This is the one. Newbie, Lily Boy, Tibby, Stardust, and Bruiser. So then you're left with eight. Yeah. So you won't find it difficult to let go of any of these cats here. Um, We're talking eighteen cats. Good homes are found for them. Very, very happy. I guess. It, that's not happy, but it's, you know, it's for the best for them. That's the bottom line. You OK, Brian? Mm. It's hard. To know that they'll be going elsewhere, yeah. Mm. It's tough, isn't it? <sighs> yes, it's almost... Um, I feel like when I first lost one of my first cats, that was... I had to put her down, and that wasn't very nice, and I feel pretty much the same right now. Yeah. Whatever happens with these cats is going to be absolutely positive and the right thing for them, otherwise it won't happen. Previously, I wasn't sure if he was just hypothetically saying, yes, I'd like to get rid of some, but now, I think the emotion coming out really shows how serious he is about mm. genuinely going through with it. Well done for today. Thank you. You've done brilliantly. <laughs> See, that was agreement, I think. <laughs> you feeling all right? I'm feeling good. I'm yeah. feeling good. If you took the helm, how can I be going wrong? I know it needs to happen. I know that... Um, I need to find homes for these cats, so uh, this day was going to come sooner or later, and even though they haven't gone, the emotion is still there, knowing that they're going to be going. It's, it's good. It's good. Both Brian and Lynn look after lots of animals at home without extra help. And this is tough going. 
Now I'm in Lincolnshire to meet somebody who almost never says no to more animals and does it all single-handedly. Can this possibly work? Hi Tamara, it's Jasmine. I'm outside the gate. Thank you, see you in a sec. Tamara Lloyd runs a sanctuary and has 300 rescued animals, which occupy both her house and the land she owns. Hello. Hi there. How are you? Nice to meet you. And you as well. I'm intrigued to see what you've got here. She introduces me first to the farm animals she's rescued. This is pig heaven, is it? Look at this. Here you've got three pigs or are there more? Uh, no, there are seven pigs. Seven? Uh, two turkeys, um, 12 geese, two ducks, um, a strange sort of goose, and <laughs> then I've got a couple of catteries in here as well. Where have the pigs come from? This chap here, he was found when he was six weeks old wandering around York. This little girl here... So a little pot-bellied one. Yeah, when she came, she was the size of one of the cats. But she was absolutely minute and living in a flat in the middle of Lincoln. Living in a flat? How much do you reckon he weighs? 200 kilos, maybe. God! I thought I was heavy. <laughs> <laughs> so, look at those two in the window. They are so adorable. How many are in the house? 38. Tamara's been rescuing animals her whole life. And she now takes in those that virtually no other sanctuary will accept. Steady, steady. Flora! Hello, darlings, I'm sorry. Elvis, it's all right, there's a good right. Tamara gets up at six every morning. She normally works a 14-hour day to feed and clean out all the rescued animals. Steady! Hey! What is it that you're trying to... Do here. Um, What's I, your aim? Well, uh, now the situation is that my aim is I want the sanctuary to continue into the future, and also there is a desperate need for it to expand because there just are so many animals. That that seems quite ambitious, you know, to think you've got so much going on here already with just you. Can it can it work? Um, I'm fairly confident that I think it's going to be OK. Um, there are people who think I'm... Well, people quite often think I'm mad, but um, people <laughs> who think that, you know, it is too much and that it, it's not something that I can manage. But it is just very difficult now to say no to people when they keep putting pressure on you to just take one more animal. <laughs> Tamara's mother, Edith, has come to stay. She's heavily involved in the sanctuary and tries to keep a watchful eye on the number of animals that Tamara takes in. She's now got 37 dogs, and when she came here, she had four. It's just... I hate to break manageable. it to you, but I think she said today that she's actually got 38. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big responsibility. It's a hell of a responsibility, and, it's, and, you know, it's always a worry, and if she goes out, she's always worried when she comes home in case something's gone wrong or something like that, you see. What are the implications for her in saying no to taking in another animal? Well, she feels very, very bad about it. And she'll phone me and she'll say, well, you know, this is... Bit... And, you know, we talk about it. And I say to her, you've just got to say no. There is no way you can take any more. But Tamara's solution is to buy even more land to house the animals. Is he down? So she never has to say no. For her, this commitment is total. OK, calm down. <laughs> Caesar! I have, I have to be completely honest. I absolutely hate mud. I would love to have a really immaculate house, and I, would, I am quite heavily into cleanliness and tidiness, but 
I prefer my animals to having an immaculately clean house. It's easy to think of Tamara as an eccentric, but in reality, she's mopping up and caring for the unwanted animals that other people throw out. Hello, I'm sorry, I know it's a little bit on the late side, isn't it? I just hope she doesn't push herself too far. But I think Lynn has pushed herself too far. Hello, kid. She finds it almost impossible to leave her dogs, even for a day. And given Lynn's enormous effort, I also want to know how well it's working for her dogs. Just here. She's agreed to let me bring in Sue Ketland, an expert in dog behaviour and training from Wood Green Animal Charity. <laughs> They're all coming through. I'm going to put them out so that we can we can spend a bit more time with the others. Come on, then. To form a view about Lynn's rescue, Sue must look around the house and meet all the dogs. Go on, out you go. Good boy, in you go. Yeah, just shut it, that's it. No. Look out, Jacob. This is Dolly. Um, she, with me and Bob, she's absolutely fine. Wonderful. With all my dogs, she's absolutely fine. But as soon as anybody comes in, she goes into a quiver and rank. We've got Kenji. And you haven't eaten your breakfast. He's absolutely gorgeous. But when we're out and about, he doesn't like strangers approaching from behind. OK. This is Monty, not long been with us. Come out of a pound. Hi, Monty. He had... He was raw, all down his back. That's all healed now. This is Ella. She is adorable. So is she ready for rehoming now? Yes. Holly's got a home waiting for us. She will be going end of this week, oh. weekend. And this is Tara. I consider that she might end up being one of my failures. In my rescue experience, um, obviously, I go to work yeah. um, and I do my job and I come home. Are you able to strike any, any form of, of balance between your rescue work and your, your real life? No. Mm. It, is, it is completely my life. And what's your average annual turnover, would you say? Do I would numbers? say that we probably rehome between 70 and 100 a year. Right, OK, OK. You know. Although Lynn's running a rescue, her own dogs live there too. With 17 oh. dogs in total okay. under the same roof, their welfare and how they get along together are major considerations for Sue. If I were to be totally honest, and I see your concentration, for all the right reasons, is on the dogs that you're saving. But on the other hand, you have your family group. And just from an outside perspective, looking in, there are, I would say, some issues that are going on behind the scenes all the time with your own dogs. There's always that level of tension going to be in the house, whether we can see it or not, it's going to be yeah. here. There's never been a, a, a fight or anything between no. any of these dogs. Um, you know, there's, it never goes beyond just a you will behave yourself. Sue also has an idea for Lynn about increasing her turnover of rescue dogs. You have six dogs of your own, some with higher needs than others. I think, in all reality, three, possibly four, would still be pushing rescue dogs in to yeah. work with, rehabilitate, train, sort, go. Next one's in, go. And I think the turnover would be much higher the less you had. Sue thinks that by working with fewer rescue dogs at a time, Lynn will save more. And there's one dog in particular she's bothered about. Poppy, what a sweetheart of a dog. What She's an absolute little sweetie. My heart goes out to her condition-wise. Yeah. But if you were to look at it cold and clinically, yeah. she's going to be a constant drain on your charity's resources, isn't she? Yeah, yeah. And I look at that from a rehoming perspective, knowing how expensive skin conditions are. Yeah. She'll never get insurance um, for yeah. that. So 
either somebody's got to have deep pockets or the charity has got to have quite deep pockets. Yeah. Sue worries that Poppy will struggle to recover in Lynn's house alongside so many other dogs. And with a long queue of healthy dogs waiting to be saved, deciding on Poppy's future is yet more pressure for Lynn. Basically, I'm putting everything into it now because I know that maybe five years down the line, I'm not going to be able to do this. I wouldn't just hand it over and walk away. I still want to be very much involved. I, I can't imagine you taking yeah. a back seat very easily, to be honest. But at the end of the day, the whole the whole goal for, for for this this what was meant to be this tiny little rescue is that I can get it up and running and sufficient and working. I'm going to get blubbery and working how I want it to work, and just be everyone's backup because I know as time's gone on that my health is deteriorating. I think Lynn's done an amazing job for dogs over the years, and I hope she takes on what Sue says, even though it sounds tough. Brian has agreed to reduce the number of cats from 26 to eight. But it's not something that expert Vicky thinks he can manage on his own. The deal is, I will help to rehome six of the difficult cats. So these are the ones that, that really haven't been well socialised and we probably need to work with a bit before we can find the, the right homes for them. Brian's part of the deal is to rehome 12 of the ones that are easier, they're friendly, good to go, so they should be easier to home. None of this is going to be easy. And today, Vicky's arranged for animal charity Wood Green to come and pick up six cats. This one scraggles. She'll be going today. She's a lovely cat, absolutely wonderful cat. Uh, she's the one that likes drinking the water out from the uh, dripping taps. And one thing that really does worry me, once these cats are, are rehomed and Brian is down to his eight cats, what will happen when another strange cat wanders into his garden? What will Brian do? How will he stop himself from feeding that cat? Mm, one down, no <laughs> five to go. <laughs> I didn't push a flat down far enough. There was enough for him to get a paw in there to push it up. Ah, uh, OK. So who's gone? All of them? Um, yes. Okay. I'm really worried about that now. Who is it we wanted to get next? It was... It was Charlie. Charlie. He's just there. I suspect that Brian and I probably need to do quite a bit of talking just to make absolutely sure that Brian knows what's in the best interests of, of his cats, and that is not to get into the same predicament again. Have you got any holes in the wall or anything in here, Brian? Yep, there is a hole in the wall. Um, there's a hole in the floor. And a hole in the floor. And he's gone down it. He's gone down the hole in the floor. <laughs> okay. If I want to do the best for not just myself, but for the cats, I have to understand their relationships with each other, not just the relationship that I have with them, and that is something I've neglected in the past. So I'm pretty sure that I'll resist accepting more cats into the house. No! Come on in. Outside, really. Hi, Papa. What's it? Good lad. Come on, do you want to go? Come up high. There we go. He'll be like that for a little while, maybe half an hour, and then he'll settle. Really? Yeah. I've got nothing but high hopes for them. 
Hello. This caught me eye. What's going on? I've actually realised that everything that's been said is probably absolutely spot on. I do get completely worn down. I don't begrudge any of that. I, I love what I do, but I do see a need that actually I've got to slow down for my own selfish reasons, I suppose. <laughs> I think it'll be very strange for me not to have a house full of dogs, and I'll never stop fostering. That I know 100%. But I do need to, to take a little bit of stock of, of what's going on in my life and bring back some of the things that have always been important to me that maybe I've put to one side for a while. This has been my life for such a long time. I needed somebody to actually say to me, look, Lynn, maybe it would be a good idea to, to cut back and sort of think of yourself as well as the dogs. Come on! Maybe it's time for me and Bob to have a bit of a life again. The feeling of being free would be very much sought after. I'd feel more comfortable going away, going on holiday. There's many things that I can see that I can do when the number's been reduced. Tonight is a special night. Lynn and Bob are going for a proper dinner together for the first time in 10 years. Okie doke, we're off then. Just go, find enjoy yourself. yourselves. Lynn has trusted friends Nikki and Bill to dog sit. Raven, no Jack. Puppy. Jacko, eight. Jacko, eight. I also know that I've got to slow it down a bit and think about us a bit more. Yeah. That would be nice. <laughs> Maybe start getting the numbers down yeah, at home. At home and, and start getting the house back yeah. together a bit. Yeah. I've met some remarkable people on my journey and hundreds of animals. Sorry, well, Lady. Well. No, 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 no. This is, <laughs> is Haley. No, 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 this was Haley. Sorry, I'm miles away. I am sorry. I definitely think having animals in our lives is a good idea. Are you on the table? Mouse. Is that allowed? Oh. Not really, no. Mouse, can you get down, please? When you're in the thick of it, it's hard to see when your animals have taken over. <laughs> Like you've made a person. You don't I can't hear anything you're saying, by the way. <laughs> In the end, life's got to be good for the animals and for you. I've just noticed all these bowls. <laughs> you've got a serious amount of washing up every day. <laughs> yeah.